All right, well, howdy, folks, and welcome to the Lifestyle Overland channel. Now, usually we're traveling about the country, exploring places with my family, but in this video, we're gonna be covering this box sitting right here next to me. This mystery box might just be a game changer for us and for a few of you as well. I should probably address the elephant in the room as well, and that is our 1980 Land Cruiser HJ45 sitting behind me. Now, while this rig has no shortage of power under the hood, it does have a shortage of auxiliary electrical power, and that's what we're hoping this box is gonna fix. Now, before we dig into the nuts and bolts of this build, I think we should address some obvious questions and maybe justify our strategy just a little bit. So the first question would be, why not just buy one of those portable power units? And that's a really good point. There's a lot of good battery banks on the market between Goal Zero, Jackery, Blue Eddy, and those are gonna be a great fit for 90% of the folks out there. They're compact, they're already built, and they put out a lot of power, but they don't have the long-term flexibility that we want in this system. So the other end of the spectrum would be, well, why not just go ahead and build a permanent auxiliary power system on board? Well, we've still got a lot more work left to go. We've been working on this rig for eight years, nine years now, and it's not quite ready. There's not a safe and secure spot for us to put all those different devices just yet. And so this gets us out the door with a lot of power and a lot of capabilities. Going this route is gonna give us the opportunity to add all kinds of custom loads and even add in a Bluetooth controller like a Switch Pro or S-Pod. So there's a lot more capabilities that's gonna come out of this beyond just powering your basic around the camp loads. But that's in the future. Another advantage to this over a permanently installed system is the portability. We'll be able to move this from one vehicle to the next if we so choose. And honestly, to top it all off, we just want to see how this compares to other options so that we know whether or not items like this are worth the effort to build yourself or if you're better off going with a pre-built battery bank system. That's what we're here for. We want to test and try and then report back to you guys what we found out. And at the end of the day, help you make informed decisions about how you want to build your own Overland vehicle. Now, how this all gets started, well, if you remember back in season five, episode 18, my good friend Billy showed up in his big behemoth 2500 GMC pickup truck. And they'd been traveling for several weeks and what they found was that their Jackery system just was not providing the consistent power that they had hoped. They were having to recharge and it was taking way too long to recharge. And so they found that there was a lot of struggle keeping their fridge cool, keeping everything powered. And so while he was here visiting with me, we hashed out some quick and dirty ideas just to get him some power so that he didn't have to worry about powering that fridge or some of his other loads. And so in the episode, we developed what we're gonna call the quick and dirty 1.0, just a lithium battery, DC to DC charger from Red Arc, a voltmeter, a couple of USB ports, and a 12 volt port for that fridge. The whole design was just simple, relatively inexpensive, and he's been loving it ever since. So I think even that configuration is gonna be a huge help to a lot of folks trying to power all those little things that they've been adding to their rig. If after you watch this video, you decide that's the route you wanna go, you can get a full parts list by going to lso.link forward slash quick and dirty. But it was that project that got me thinking, especially when it came to adding power to the beast here. What is gonna be a good option for the long haul. And so we contemplated what were our needs? Well, we needed pure sine wave power for our Starlink internet and also for charging our laptops. We needed USB ports for charging our camera batteries and things like that. And we wanted to be able to have an MPPT solar charging capabilities along with DC to DC. But instead of going with visible gauges, I opted to go for something more Bluetooth oriented. So I didn't have to actually go and physically open the case to check status. I could just pull my phone up and take a look at the Bluetooth app. But the biggest goal was to make it portable, rugged, and somewhat weatherproof. I, at this point, have no worries about just laying this out in a downpour. One of the challenges that we kind of quickly came against was finding components that were readily available. There's been shortages, some things have long lead times, and so we kind of had to get selective on the things that we used. And I also wanted to go with some of the more inexpensive parts to see if we could get that price point between the pre-built power banks and something that's actually home-built. Obviously, if there's $500 discrepancy, if this costs that much more, then there's no need to go and build this in your garage. Just go ahead and get an all-inclusive unit. And so 
that's what our goal was, is we wanted to try and build these as competitively as possible between the two options. And then finally, all those components needed to work together. It needed to be mostly plug and play so that your average handy person could build this in their garage over the weekend without having to buy a whole bunch of specialized tools or customize or fabricate any special components to make this all work together. All right, so let's jump in the build, but one last important note, if you want to find more information on all the parts and components that we used, you can head to the description or you can just type in lso.link forward slash beast power. All right, so without further ado, let's build this thing. All right, well, let's introduce you to our starting lineup. This is the Renogy 100 amp hour lithium battery that includes self-heating function, RJ45 connections for Bluetooth monitoring, and a handy tool to put it into storage mode when not needed. Next up is the Renogy 1000 watt pure sine wave inverter with two 120 volt outlets along with a custom connection point as well. For charging duties, we have the Renogy DC to DC and solar MPPT controller. This unit also has capabilities of tying to a Bluetooth hub and to allow us to keep tabs on things with the Renogy app, the Bluetooth module. For all of our brand circuits, we're going to go to the tried and true Blue C six circuit fuse panel with dedicated ground lugs. For 120 volt connections, we have these trick weatherproof receptacles. And for our solar and alternator connections, flush mount Anderson plugs. And for all those accessories, we've got the Blue C dual USB chargers and 12 volt socket. For overcurrent protection, we're going to the Red Arc 40 amp inline fuse kit. And for keeping the case cool during the summer months, we have these variable speed thermostatically controlled electronic fans. These include everything you need to hook it up as well as a programmable circuit board. And to keep things from getting tangled in the fans, it also includes the wire guards. We'll be using this four inch louvered vent cover for the exhaust. For tying it all together, we've got number six AWG welding cable. It's super flexible and super tough. And all of this is going to live in a condition one weather tight case. All right, let's get to work. All right, we're not going to need this. Really nice case though. And it says it's made in the USA. All right, first order of business. Let's get everything laid out. The nice part about lithium batteries is you can lay them on their sides. I will give you a fair warning. Do not even think about attempting this with a traditional lead acid battery that vents or an AGM because you're not going to be able to lay it on its side. And the reason lead acid will definitely not work in this is because it's going to be an enclosed space and you can build up explosive gases in here with other electronic devices, which can go boom. Now our inverter. Something like that. And our DC to DC is going to go here. I haven't decided quite yet where this fuse block is going to go. I'm thinking I may just do some industrial Velcro right on top of the inverter, but we'll figure that out as we go. All right, so these little Anderson plugs are going to go right over here. So we're going to cut out a spot here and here, and that'll be our solar input and our alternator input. Now ventilation is always gonna be key because we're not gonna have this lid open all the time. If it's raining, we wanna be able to protect it and we'd rather just keep the dust and dirt out of it to start with. But we do have a couple of areas of concern. First of all is gonna be this heat sink here for the DC to DC. So the plan is to utilize this mostly flat space here and I had hoped that that was going to work there, but it is not. Well, it would appear that Amazon sent me the wrong size vent. I ordered four inches and this is five and a half. So my plan to have vents in this area has been shot in the foot. We're going to adapt and overcome though, because when it comes to ventilation, bigger is better. And if I can make these work, I want to make them work. And I've got an idea. So here in the back of the box, we have a nice big working surface here. Plenty of space for us to 
put these guys in. They do overhang on the bottom just a touch, but not bad. We can we can work with that. So I'm gonna end up doing two. One here, somewhere in here, and then I'll put the powered fans right behind these. So here's our layout. Originally, I wanted to put the battery dead center on the bottom because it's the heaviest thing in here. Not by much, but that's not gonna happen. We have to move it over here. So we're gonna slide it up against this wall. The inverter, somewhere about there, DC to DC on this wall here. Now I definitely want some form of ventilation to go behind this heat sink. So I'll probably try and find a couple of actual four inch vents to go in the back, but we're gonna move ahead with the installation for now. May surprise us, maybe it doesn't put out that much heat. Probably gonna end up also taking off the foam from the lid. I think it's just kind of glued on there just so we don't have anything that can be combustible if anything decides to go supernova in here. All right, so this is our main concern. We wanna keep this guy stable. And I bought a two pack of straps. And so the problem is I can't go across the middle of this because I need access to the port for these RJ45s or Cat6s. And so instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one strap around this way and then I'm gonna crisscross it with another strap up and over this way here. So even if you did drop it and this thing busted open, which I don't think it ever would, the battery's not going anywhere. All right, let's just get these guys centered up. Get a couple marks. I wanna make sure that we're not interfering with our lugs. So come down a little bit low here, just like that. Rinse and repeat. Strap this guy down. There we go. Oh yeah, that'll hold. pieces inverter and the DC to DC now I want to make sure before I get ahead of myself that I'm not gonna have too much interference back here with these fans that I have in mind so obviously the lugs will have to land coming in sideways which is not a big deal it's totally fine but I can cheat it this way some just to get a little bit of help but I can't go too far because I have these guys. And I'm just trying to make this easy for y'all so you can just plug that straight in. But if we wanted to gain all kinds of space, we could actually cut this off, strip it back, and then land it underneath these terminals here. Which is kind of nice because it would give us two inside receptacles as well. So we may end up doing that. But again, I'm just trying to use pieces that are kind of plug and play for everyone. And it's just going to take some play in to figure out the best combo. The main thing is, is we don't want to interfere with our termination points. And I also need to move the color from this guy because we're going to be terminating a lot of stuff onto this too. So let's take that off, play with this a little bit more, and then anchor these two guys down. All right, so... These guys are just falling out. So we'll move them out of the way for now. And let's look at the best spot for our fans. So I don't want to cut into the integrity of this hinge. I really don't want to 
compromise the integrity of any of these upward braces either. So we're going to try and stay in these voids. So I'm just going to make a mark here. And then the other one, it's going to go here. And then I'll drill these out so I can just go on the inside where it's a little flatter to lay out our holes. So we've got the top points for our vents marked there. So we know where that's going. And that'll allow us to lay our fans in, get the holes lined up for that. So let's go ahead and get our holes drilled for our inverter and our DC to DC. Okay, and then this guy. All right, since we're in layout mode, then I'm going to put a 120 outlet here and a 120 outlet there. So those guys will get cut out, mounted there and there. And then on this side, we're going to use this protected area here to put these guys in place. So USB chargers and then just a regular 12 volt plug as well. All right, I think we've got everything planned out now. So we're going to remove all of this stuff out of our way and make a mess. The straps really turned out pretty nice. All right, so these guys dropping in right here. So I just need to cut a hole inside of that. It just so happens I have a hole saw, the perfect size. You can also use a jigsaw, anything. It's plastic, it's pretty easy to cut. Cross flow, I've only got room for one on this other side. So we're gonna make do, and it looks like I need to take out the old breather here. Just like that. Sixteenth center, same on this side. The problem with sharp hole saws is they want to drag, so run them backwards every now and then. And now for the last ones, these little boogers. Kind of a Kentucky windage measurement here since I think we're good. The heck? Well, don't do like I did. That sucks. A little faster speed helps.
All right, so I'm running into some snags with size discrepancies. I really wanted to use these heavier duty louvered mounts on the outside, and I might still yet, but for now, I'm gonna go with simplicity and just use these wire guards until I can figure out a better way. All right, time to install this guy. Most likely not going to reuse this cover simply because this is all a protected environment in here. It's not like it's mounted in a storage area of a vehicle. So we're just going to pull it all off. Now while there's a lot of different ways that you can terminate these battery cables, one of the most consistent ways that we've found is to use a hydraulic press. And don't be intimidated by this tool, it's only about 40 bucks on Amazon. But I will forewarn you, depending on the brand, the labels on the dies may not work for the size cable you're working with. So you may have to try this once, and then maybe go up a size to get that final crimp. Just always test and tug on your terminations before you heat shrink them. All right, so rather than just showing you a wiring diagram, I'll show you exactly what we did here. So the way I have these oriented, the bottom is the negative. So I have two black wires coming off of the bottom of each one of these Anderson plugs. And they're coming over here to our DC to DC charger. And this is our junction point. So three wires is a little bit much. And you know, if you were putting a cover on this, boy, I just don't even know how, 
how you would do it in other situations. Anyhow, we're coming out the side. We're ditching the cover. Um, we may trim it to fit around, but probably not at this stage. So we have from here, the negative takes off, goes underneath here and ties in to the battery. And then from the battery, just keeping it tidy, we drop down and tie into the inverter back here. And then just to kind of spread out our connection points, we come back off of this again, down, around, and up to our fuse panel, which we've mounted with VHB tape to the top of the inverter, just making use of a new space. Now it's time to move on to the positive connections. All right, once again, let's walk you through our positive side. So decided to make this one the solar input. So I routed this over here and I'll clean this up with some zip ties and sticky backs, make it look a little, little nicer, a little neater. But I have a 40 amp inline fuse here. So if for some reason we connect a crazy assortment of solar panels and throw too much juice in here, we're not gonna damage this guy. That's the point of that. And then this is the future input from the vehicle. So that bottom Anderson plug there is actually the vehicle side. So we'll eventually make longer connections with what I have left here with another Anderson plug. And that's where this will come in. And it just shoots down here and ties to what says alternator. And here on the other side, this is our output. So this is coming out of the DC to DC. This is the proper juice for charging this lithium battery. And it just routes its way along here, over, and then up to the battery. And then from the battery we split, we take power to our fuse block and we take power to the inverter here. All right, well now that we've got all of our primary wiring complete, now it's time to come in here and put all of our secondary wiring or our branch circuits and interconnections in place. Now, for starters, this DC to DC talks to this battery and vice versa. So they included this, I guess this is probably a Cat5 cable to connect the two. As you can see, it's made for vehicle applications where this might be farther apart. And so I'm actually gonna pull this little job out of storage which I've been hanging on to. So it's gonna be the perfect length to tie this to the battery without having a lot of excess. And then we have our Bluetooth connection that we'll be plugging into the battery so that we can get the app going, get everything talking together. And then this is the ignition source cable. So if you have a smart alternator, which most newer vehicles do, if you're gonna be routing your Anderson plug system back to your alternator then this right here is going to want to run with it and tie to an ignition source so that you can tell your factory alternator to send your dc to dc all the juice it possibly can otherwise you're going to be limited and then this piece here is our temperature probe for the battery so that the dc to dc knows what this is operating at obviously it's going to be a pretty much a, a mutual environment so we'll put this in tuck it nice and neat out of the way get this RTD over here close to the battery. And then we have our fan controller, which the setup on this looks a little funky, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research on how to turn it on and off uh, at the proper set points. And then this is just a junction cable to tie the two fans together. And this right here is the temperature probe for the fan controller itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick this in here so that it doesn't disappear and then we'll find a nice little place to mount this guy. And then we also have this wiring harness that came with our USB kit. There was actually a faceplate I'd hoped to put somewhere on the box, but just didn't have the space. So I kind of exploded the kit, put these in individually, but I'm going to reuse this wiring harness because that's gonna save us probably 30 minutes of wiring. All right, let's get after our little connections now. So this is gonna be labeled BTS for battery temperature sensor. 
like so. I'm not too worried about this because it's going to be in the same compartment, but I am going to pull a little bit out and try to get it a little closer to the battery. So I think I'm just going to tuck him right behind here. Something like that right there. And I'm not too concerned about cleaning all this wiring up yet. I want to get everything in first so that I'm not having to rework things, cut things loose. It's better to get it close and leave it loose and then come back and tie wrap everything up whenever it's done. All right, next we're going to tie our two units together with this Cat6 cable. Actually, this is a Cat6E, it's super special. Open this little guy up. So this side here is our link. Tie that guy right there. And look, this was basically the perfect link. That's why I always save any cable I can. Because you never know when a little project like this is gonna need something like that. And I am OCD about my cable organization. So I'm trying to make it not just functional, but pretty. Because I was in a past life, an electrician in the IBEW. And I think that right there is gonna work. Now this is just a big old gob of cable. Now, if I wanted to get real creative, I could actually cut this. I have the tools to add a new RJ45 connector here. But for now, let's make sure it works just in case <laughs> we have to send something back. I don't wanna have something all lopped off in that situation. God forbid that something doesn't work now. I think I can kind of tuck this little packet right down in here and even structurally help that battery have a little bit of a suspension. And I think I may just do some double-sided tape again right there. And that'll look pretty nice and neat, I think. All right, I have indeed decided to put this over here. So I'm just gonna give it a quick little wipe off, a little bit of acetone so there's no residue keeping our double-sided tape from sticking. Now obviously we could take this battery out, drill this guy, do that whole process, but there is a ridge in the way. And so just to make it simple, I'm gonna try the double-sided tape, it's not heavy. And if you do decide to use double-sided tape for any of these components, do not scrimp. Go 3M, go with VHB, called very high bond that's what that stands for and um, yeah this is this is good stuff all right same thing on this fuse holder I'm gonna do uh, another little piece of double-sided tape right here clean that guy off now if I was to build a second one of these knowing what I know now knowing where everything goes I would have went ahead and pre-mounted this and the Bluetooth, but this is gonna work just fine. Not bad for a first go around. So you can see I kinda got this piece a little bit shorter than what I would like. I'd like to have a little more flow here, but it's gonna work. And I suggest you buy a nice quality set of what we call sticky backs and also a little trick is go ahead and put your zip tie in there before you install it. It makes it a little bit easier. Now, pro tip, you'd probably think you'd want to cut this this way. But if you'll go edge to edge with these flush cutters, you basically guarantee nobody's going to get nicked on the end of that tie wrap. Looks like my shrink wrap. Didn't quite get all the way sealed there. A little bit of help. All right, now let's look at mounting our fan controller. We need to give this thing power. So I'm thinking, just to make it simple, we may stick this guy here. It's kind of a challenge though, because it didn't really give us a mounting option for this controller. So we may have to insulate the back of this with something before we stick it to anything. What I might do is again use our VHB friend and stick it straight to the side of the battery here. But first let's add a couple of terminals to the ends of these guys. Personally I'm a fan of the ring terminals because you know they're not coming off but you can also use the spade style as well. 
Let's just make sure that that's going to go over our screw. Oh yeah, that'll work. So there's always a challenge with these smaller cables because sometimes it's hard to find larger ring terminals with small 22 gauge crimp areas. So there's a little trick that we like to use where we basically strip about twice what we need. Like so. And then you're just gonna double the wire back on itself. And that's gonna make for a much more secure connection point. Just don't forget your heat shrink before you do the thing. Probably not even necessary in this situation because it is gonna be right there at the junction box. I got a little carried away with that. Maybe a little bit larger heat shrink next time. And there's our splitter for the fans. Okay, we got both of our fan feeds pulled up here. I'm going to click this guy on here. Okay. So I'm thinking. Now since this is plastic, it's not going to conduct anything. So we shouldn't have any issues with those connection points on the back. I thought about using VHB tape, but I am afraid that there might be some conductivity to the tape itself. And I didn't want to end up messing with the programming on the fan controller. So we're going to try this and see how it does. There is a button on this board, so we don't want to interfere with that. And there are some LEDs as well, so I'm going to leave this loose until we decide if we like this or not. Now we'll terminate this guy. Obviously we don't need a 15 amp fuse, so I'll swap that out. Probably do a two and a half or five, something like that. Again, I wish there was a better compartment for this, but we're gonna just make do. We'll add one more Sticky back over there. All right, now we're gonna sneak behind these cables. And it looks like positive is all here on the right, which is the red cables. Probably should have wired these before installing the big cables, but big cable routing definitely takes priority. And then fish these yellow ones down for our ground. There we go. Now I just need to land a ground here and power here. Now I had originally hoped to cut a hole on the side of this for this switch, but as you can see, the keepers are very, very thin. So this is for probably a 16th or less of uh, thickness. So it's not gonna work. So I'll have to get a new switch and eventually put that in if I want outside access. So for now, and again, this is temporary, I'm just going to set this guy up to live right here for now. Maybe a second one down there would be even better. It's a little more stable now. That'll work for now. Now buying quality lugs is worth its weight in gold. And that's why we pull on these things. Unfortunately, I'm just working with some of the cheaper Amazon kits here. And as you can see, the quality of the metal doesn't always hold the crimp as good as it could. 
So you may have to use the uninsulated portion of your crimpers to get that last little squeeze in. Sometimes you have to give it a little extra. Just do your best to avoid puncturing the insulation. Should have put this on before I zip tied it all together. Zip ties are last, folks. As tempting as it might be, don't anchor stuff until you're done. All right, well that wraps up all of our wiring for now. Obviously we have a lot more space to add other accessories, other charge ports. Maybe we'll put some charge ports inside. For me, I might even have a little spot where I put all my battery chargers for my cameras. That way if it is raining, I can slap everything in here, shut it down, and not have to worry about having anything external to the box itself. But before we go through and tidy up all of our wiring with our zip ties and stuff, let's test it. There's nothing worse than having everything nice, neat, and clean and find out either you wired something wrong or one of the components was just bad out of the box and you didn't know it. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's test this puppy and see how it does. Now I'm sure some of you have noticed by now that I'm kind of doing a no-no. I'm wearing jewelry while working on electrical components, even DC components. And the reason for that is I wasn't too worried since this battery itself has its own disconnect. So there's not been any power on the system the entire time. This little guy right here <laughs> is the ignition switch for the battery. Kind of cool, right? So to get this all started, we're gonna plug this into the battery and make it go live. Now let's see if this guy works. Beeps anyhow. Moment of truth. Oh, those are stout. Oh yeah. All right, so an important step that we need to take here is ensure that our DC to DC and solar charger is set to the proper profile. If I'm understanding the manual right, I'm guessing this is the LED that changes color. So we press and hold. We're looking for blue. So yellow is gel. Green is your standard lead acid. And blue is lithium. I don't know why it's changing colors though. All right. So don't press and hold like it says in the manual. Just tap it. So now we're set up. This is the battery status indicator. So yellow is saying that it needs some charging. All right, now that we've got power, we're gonna install the Renogy app on the phone, get everything set up, get everything linked together and see what we got. No, don't make phone calls. Guess we gotta sign up. Why do you need to know my location? That I don't understand. Don't allow. Huh. I swear these devices these days, guys. There's the battery. 
Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, well, we've got the battery, and I'm not sure if we need to have power on the DC to DC at this point, so I guess let's get some solar going to the DC to DC and see if our status changes. That part's working. Now, I did have to unplug our Bluetooth and plug it into the DC to DC charger to get information on the charger, but now I don't have any information on the battery. I was under the impression that this should all talk together, but we're not getting that. Now our battery type is set to lithium. We get our house battery volts, but now we can't talk directly with the battery now. <laughs> well, <laughs> it seems their technical support crew is a little busy. Probably with the same question. I don't have 43 minutes to waste on this. Okay, so admittedly, I didn't dig too deep into this idea, but I figured if the battery has two RJ45 connections, if you're talking about a hub type setup, you should be able to plug one Bluetooth adapter into the battery, another RJ45 over to the DC to DC charger. There's thousands of devices in the world that connect that way. But what I found online was there's a hub, so I can buy a hub for $50 and then plug both units into the hub and then tie that to the Bluetooth. I'll still shoot an email to their support team to see if there's another workaround, but it looks like I need one more device to be able to talk to both the DC to DC charger and the battery itself. Not a deal breaker, but a little disappointing. All right, so the final piece on this configuration is this fan controller. It's a little bit weird. As you can imagine with only one button to make adjustments with, it's a little bit weird. But if you read the instructions on Amazon, it's actually fairly simple. All I did was I put power to it by putting the fuse in made sure that the thermocouple was out, this little wire right here. Click the button to go to setup mode, and then double click until the minimum fan speed went all the way down to zero. That way, we're not sitting here at room temperature and the fans are running. We don't want them on at all if the weather is nice or if it's super cold outside. We don't want to be pumping cold air in here because lithium needs to be at a good temperature to charge. So basically I set that to the bare minimum and then what's really cool is with those off now if I just hold my fingers over this thermocouple warm it up a little bit fans start rolling and it's exponential so you're only using the amount of power that you need to cool this confined space now obviously I can only get up to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit by holding this between my fingers but look what happens when I do this. That's going to keep this compartment nice and cool. And watch it go back down again. I like that. We're only using the power that we need to keep this cool when we need it cool. All right, so obviously we're gonna have parasitic draws. We're gonna have parasitic draws from the LEDs and electronics within the DC to DC and solar controller. We've got parasitic draw from the Bluetooth controller. So if this is not being used, that's where this little guy is gonna come in clutch. You're just gonna pull this out of the uplink, plug it in, press the button, send this puppy into storage mode once it's topped off, obviously. And then you're ready, you're set for the next adventure. Just Throw this back in. I'm going to leave this right there in the case so everything that we need is going to travel right here. And now it's time we clean everything up.
All right, so now the testing begins. Now I didn't cover it in this video, but I will be adding a set of heavy cables from the primary electrical system on the Beast here, routed to the rear with an Anderson plug so that it can plug into the DC to DC input for the box. Now, if you have multiple vehicles, they don't even have to be overland rigs. Let's say you've got a large SUV that sometimes you wanna to take to the beach and power a fridge along with all the other stuff that the kids probably wanna charge. Putting those heavy cables in that factory system routed to the back with an Anderson plug is gonna allow you to grab this box and throw it in any of your vehicles at any time. And if you don't have any use for the pure sine wave 120 volt power, well, you're already ahead of the game. You can actually go to a smaller box. You can delete that from here. It's gonna save some weight. It's gonna save some time. And I'd love to see what you come up with. So if you do go that route, feel free to email us photos. Let us know what you've learned. If you build this and you come up with a whole new way of doing it, if you have a neat idea that you think could be incorporated into this footprint, then please share it with us. We'd love to continue this story and share what we've learned as we go along. And if you guys have some feedback, that would just be amazing. Now, before I completely forget, nothing in this video was sponsored by any of the manufacturers. We went with the Renogy lineup for two reasons. One, it was readily available on Amazon. And two, the Bluetooth capabilities are gonna allow us to talk to different components within the system. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the way we had hoped with the CAN bus setup, but we're gonna dig into that a little bit more and give you an update on how our fix works. All right, now it's time to load this thing up in the Beast and put it through its paces at camp. All right, well, that's gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope uh, you head out to the garage and build your own auxiliary power system, be it this or something similar. And as always, until next time, stay curious and remember to leave it better than you found it.